Good morning. We have kind of a rough subject today, but it's something we need to talk about. It's the sinner's prayer. We're going to take a look at that. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Rocks of Revelation being poured out to you. I have a passion for the lukewarm, lighting them back on fire, man. And I have a passion for lighting and stoking the fires of revival wherever we go. My house, myself, my neighborhood, my county, my state, and my nation, and the world. It starts with us. Repentance starts with me. Revival starts with me. We've got to do something. We've got to step outside of our comfort zone. Speaking of that, the National Day of Prayer is May 5th. Check it out. Go to the National Day of Prayer website and see if you have an event registered near you. Um, and go. Let's pray at lunch for America. Now, I wanted to talk about this article uh, that Susan kind of found. I'm going to pull it up on the screen here. Um, this this article is pretty awesome, uh, and I wanted to talk about it. It's called False Conversions in the Sinner's Prayer, a damnable academic, epidemic, uh, a damnable epidemic in um, the modern church. Now, they're taking the text here. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed fail the test. Amen? Let's go to Romans 8.8. 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, so if you're in the flesh, you cannot please God. And then Romans 8.9, but you, and now he's speaking to the Corinthian church, or the Romans church, he says, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Now, this is going to, this is going to hit the, the uh, sinner's prayer. We've got, there's got to be a visible change in someone's life. Repentance is more than an emotional experience. It's a changed life. Going back to the article here. This is a good question for all of us to ponder. This link will be wherever you hear this podcast. So you can go peruse this article yourself. You can comment. You can be all, all up into this if you want to be. Is Christ in you? How do you know? What proof is there of his presence in your life? Of course, along with Paul, I believe there's a core belief that surrounds true faith. But this task asks about your subjective awareness. So is Christ in you. Amen. I recently addressed this issue in episode three of Fire Away. Now, the link, there's some other links in this article that's going to rock. Okay. Um, there's a Paul Washer video. I mean, it's, it's, they've got more than just this article. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this whole article on the podcast. So I'm going to include the link. But I'm going to take some time to expand on this area of false conversion and how the Sinner's Prayer Decisionism Theology, right, there's a link. Okay, is the leading culprit in creating false converts into churches today. Now, you often, you'll probably often see me tweet, false doctrine makes false converts. Also, read the Bible. Prayerfully, via the Spirit of Truth, read the Bible so that it's self-defense against false doctrine. In Ephesians chapter 6, uh, we see that Paul is saying we need to put on the armor of God. Right here in Ephesians 6, 10, and 11, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Now, the, my point is, is something that we need to do. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, you hear me talking about sanctification. I'm probably going to be focusing on, on faith a lot after this because uh, I've talked about sanctification quite a bit. But here's the deal. If a man, in 2 Timothy 2, 21, purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified meat for the master's use. So this is something that we do. It's something we do. God does do a change in us. He, cha he does a good work in, in us in, until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's like a co-laboring. Um, he grants us, like down here in 2 Timothy, he says, uh, if God 
peradventure will grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So God does play a part in sanctification. But we got to try a little bit. Come on, you know that that's the tenor of the text. Let's get back to the article here. Um, if you are at all familiar with social media, I have no doubt that you've seen what are known as memes. That's the picture with words, you know. Uh, one particular brand of meme I particularly enjoy buried in the hashtag things Jesus never said. Most of these include some picture of a fictitious Jesus and then a quote that goes against something Jesus said in the Bible. Recently, R.C. Sproul Jr. inadvertently created one of these with a quote in one of his speeches, and it is sad as it is funny, Mr. Sproul said. Be sure to never speak of sin or repentance because that will drive people away. Just love them into my kingdom. Then, of course, he insinuated things Jesus never said moniker. Now, back on the article here, I'm still reading the article, I think what saddens me the most is that many Christians actually believe that, the content of that quote to be biblically correct. And I've had conversations with people that go to church and they say these things they never <laughs> that's why i'm saying you got to read the bible for yourself it's self-defense against false doctrine um anyway while we're called to speak the truth in love ephesians 4 15 we must not forget that the full gospel message is more amazing and much more in depth than the americans con concocted hippie jesus so let's let's talk a little bit about the speaking the truth in love um there's a proverb and i was thinking about this um, last night, actually, not necessarily this verse, but what, what's been frustrating to me, guys, is why, why nations, why the children of God, why we keep falling away? And I'm like, well, you know, Lord, what, what, how can we prevent this, you know? And I started thinking about spheres of influence and spheres of authority. We have physical and spiritual authority over our household, Right. And, you know, I'm not really into centralized because centralized government of Christianity, because it says to every to the head of every man uh, is Christ. And there's also one, you know, obey those with the have the rule over you that speak the word of God over you. That's the ones that have the rule. And I'm thinking, well, there's a mentorship relationship going on. Um, let me find that verse for you. You know, a lot of people don't understand. They think Romans 13, for instance, is just secular authority. Um, well, the word authority has the word author as its root word. And we're our king is Jesus. You know, what he says is ultimate. We Jesus says if someone compels you to walk a mile, he was referring to the Roman secular authority, which they had a law that they could compel any non citizen to walk a mile. He said walk with them too. So there's a point where it doesn't necessarily contradict the law of God. Right. But here we have, uh, I mean, it doesn't violate what Jesus wants us to do. Like He's not saying that the secular authority says don't, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is a great example. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego said, you know, we're over here. We're doing your Nebuchadnezzar type Babylon type thing. But right now, when we're supposed to worship this idol, -uh, we're not doing that. So here we have the author in Hebrews saying, remember them which have the rule over you who has spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. So there is a spiritual type of authority which is optional for obedience here. It says, remember them which have the rule over you. So it's not like a rod-like authority in the post-cross New, New Testament for people in the church. It's, it says, whose faith follow. So following this, going back to our examination for a second of where people of God get it wrong. I was thinking about this. You know, we're supposed to correct our children. And I'm always talking about how there's a, you know, I, I did a an interview with Jay Cookingham recently from Strategic Fathering Ministries. And, you know, I read some statistics about how Prisons are full of fatherless people and how the dead, the dads were not present or they were not authority figures. They were not following morals. 
And I'm sitting here, I'm like, you know, there's no correction going on. Withhold not correction from the child. Okay. Let's go back to Proverbs 23, 12. Apply thine heart unto instruction. This is, I talked about in a recent podcast. It says, apply thine heart to instruction. I was talking about love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and strength. This application is something that we do with the mind to rule our heart in our ears to the word of knowledge. So this is something proactive that we do. We listen to those with knowledge. We listen to the spirit of truth. We read the word. Amen. And then this is a, a precursor to the next verse. Withhold not correction from the child. And I find that interesting because he's going to equate correction with a beating. You know? Amen. Reminds me of Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name. Let's read that one. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. When there's national correction going on, there's going to be famines, diseases, pestilences, and stuff like that. The things that God promises will happen. And then there's this way we need to listen to, do not forsake the chastening of the Lord. We need to go back to the correction and start listening to what God has to say. And this proverb here, it says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and thou shalt deliver his, his soul from hell. So where am I going with all of this? If you love your children, right? You'll give them the verbal warning like God's given us in the Bible. Here's the text. This is what I want you to do, right? And then if they don't follow it, they don't understand that there is, you know, you want to say punishment, but it's correction. It's making a course correction, keeping them from going to hell, and you're delivering their soul from hell. So that is love, right? Saving someone from hell is love. Sometimes we don't want to beat a child, you know, spank them because, oh, we don't want to hurt them. Well, guess what? You're doing more damage by sending them to hell. And I was thinking about these course corrections that we could have done in the Old Testament. People in the, is the priests um, and those in authority back then could have, could have enforce some of the stuff that the Lord wanted them to enforce to keep Israel from going off track. But you know what? It's it's not, it's still not that way. That still isn't the solution. So I'm still working on that, man. But here's the deal. I'm going to tell you, speaking the truth in love, they think, well, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Being politically correct is such... I mean, being politically correct is going to send people to hell. We've got to step outside of our comfort zone and say, look, I love you, therefore I'm going to tell you the word of God. You know, iron sharpens iron at the very least. Amen? So we need to be aware of, of that. Now I want to talk um, for a second about Holy Fire Japan. Holy Fire Japan, Stephen Barrett, he is a friend of mine. He's a missionary to Japan. And he did a recent blog post. If you'll notice, uh, I've been talking about him a lot. I did a couple of shows with him recently. And right now, he is helping out with the earthquake, the Kumamoto quake. And look, that's some of the devastation uh, that's going on. He's helping out with food, water. He's even helping people with gas stoves so that they can have a hot meal. There's many people displaced and uh, I just want you guys to, to check out his blog, holyfirejapan.com. Uh, there's ways to help support. You can, you can support in almost real time what's going on um, by PayPal. Uh, look, and you can see some of the pictures of actually what has been happening in Japan, uh, the, the relief effort that Steve is taking part in. And um, also check out the rest of his blog. It's actually very interesting. He's an American Christian missionary in Japan, so check him out. I've been friends with him for a long time. Good good ministry support. You know why? Because 1% of Japan 
is Christian. 1%. So what he does is he's bringing the love of Jesus to these people. Amen. Another thing he, he does is he's working with Dynamic Church Planting International. They're planting churches in a country where only 1% even know about Jesus. And one of the things that they were doing for a while, I was talking to him. I'm like, he's, he's like, uh, you know what we do is we, we uh, teach them English for free but you got to read the Gospels. That's how they do it. So I'm like, oh, wow, that's awesome. So please check out holyfirejapan.com. Now back to the article here. Um, they have a picture of Jesus, and, you know, he's the good-looking GQ Jesus that we see in, you know, the movies. This American Jesus looks like a supermodel in a Vidal Sassoon commercial rather than a man the Bible describes in Isaiah 53, too, as having no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Why is this? Why does Jesus of the Bible not align with this fabricated Jesus? The simple answer lies in the second commandment, which instructs us to not create graven images. It's a form of idolatry when we create a God to suit ourselves and needs, rather than bowing the knee to the one true and living God of the Bible. Idols are powerless aside from their use as kindling in stoking the fires of hell upon a person's eternal soul. So, how does one become saved? Take a moment to think about how people get saved in your church. Take a moment to think about it. Is there an altar call, a baptismal call, baptism weekend, or maybe it's reciting the sinner's prayer along with a pastor or elder? It could be that someone convinced you to ask Jesus into your heart, or it could be a combination of all the things listed. In regards to asking or accepting Jesus into our hearts, it's a completely ridiculous notion. Now, I'm still reading the article here, okay? So, uh, yeah, just don't throw stones at Conrad. But a lot of you people, I want you to examine the sinner's prayer. I want you to examine it, okay? As David Platt astutely noticed, accept him. Do we really think Jesus needs our acceptance? Don't we need him? Jesus is no longer one to be accepted or invited in, but one who is infinitely worthy of our immediate and total surrender. You know, think about lordship. Think about lordship. What's the difference? If you don't, you know, oh, I accept you, Jesus. Well, wait a minute. If he's Lord and Savior, let's say you have a landlord and you don't pay the rent and you don't abide by the, you start painting your walls purple when that's not in your contract, well, you're not obeying the terms of the agreement. You're not the words of your Lord are not abiding in you and you're not observing them. Amen. So think about that. Back to the article. That, dear friends, is an illustration of true reverence for our Savior. That comment illustrates that David Platt has a full understanding of exactly why Jesus Christ died on a tree for sinners such as myself. Could it be that the reason you are not growing to look like Christ is because you're not actually in him? Is it possible you have been duped into believing you've been granted justification when in fact you were fooled into the false concept of decisionism theology? Now there's a link there. Like I said, I'm going to include a link to this article so you can follow all the other links, okay? Pastor Platt went on to further expound on this notion. Should it not concern us that there's no such superstitious prayer like this sinner's prayer in the New Testament? Should it not concern us that the Bible never uses the phrases, accept Jesus into your heart or invite Christ into your life? It's not the gospel we being preached. It's not the gospel we see being preached. It's modern evangelism built on sinking sand. The sinking sand obviously is referring to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. Uh, and it runs the risk of disillusioning millions of souls. It's a very dangerous thing. This is a very strong language from Pastor David. Why would he use the word dangerous when describing something seemingly so benign? A simple prayer. The reason is because to lead people to think they're a Christian when they have not biblically responded to the gospel gives them a false sense of salvation and makes it very difficult for them to be evangelized later in life because they think they're good to go. Now that is something I've noticed. That is something. I live in the Bible Belt. And when I 
when I'm out there witnessing bus station, Bill Street, whatever, everybody says they're a Christian. So my my goal here, you know how Jesus said, I'm not come but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Well, my passion is for the lukewarm. You know, I believe that at some point they, they've had... Uh, they said the sinner's prayer. They may have had a heartfelt conversion, but have kind of fallen away. And I must say that 90-something percent of the church is doing that. The missions fields are inside the buildings. However, a lot of people uh, think that they're good to go. So now, why do they think that they're good to go? People have told them that they are. People have told them that, you know, there's no need to repent. Uh, it's just grace. You don't actually have to repent. You don't have to read your Bible. You just have to say a prayer one time 10 years ago. You're good to go. That's why people believe. They don't believe your life has to change at all. They, you know, if if Jesus lives in you, won't there be some evidence of that? Doesn't Jesus say you will know a tree by his fruit? You know, if if you're bearing worldly fruit, you know, if you're living in the world, then you're going to have a, a worldly tree, right? But if you're living in Christ, if his wires abide in you, then your fruit's going to do Jesus stuff. Amen? So, then he continues on. If we're not careful, we'll take the gospel, the lifeblood of Christianity, and put Kool-Aid in its place so it will taste better to the crowds. It's not just dangerous, it's damning. Then, when we think about making disciples, we think it's just about going out and getting someone to pray the prayer, and we spread that. No. Let's give them a full picture of the gospel. Let show people the greatness of God. Yes, he is a father who loves us. He's a loving father who will save us, but he's also a wrathful judge who may damn us. Now, I invite your comments. Uh, please comment wherever you hear this podcast, on YouTube, wherever it's put. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts on this. I'm including the link to this broadcast, to the article in this broadcast, so you can read more. I haven't even read half the article. It will definitely get you thinking about uh, the sinner's prayer versus making disciples. It will, it, the sinner's prayer versus mentorship. You know, does Jesus actually dwell in you? Do we do we find ourselves saying, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this these Christian things? And then he says, I, I don't know you. I've never had a relationship with you. There's a spirit of truth. Amen. We need to follow the spirit. So if this has touched you, please remember to rate, comment, share, and subscribe. Rate. Wherever you find this podcast, whether it be on the app, anywhere, uh, comment that helps. Any, any type of engagement helps me rise up in the rankings. Share this with your friends and family. And remember to subscribe to, the, to s- subscribe either to the podcast or to the inner circle letter that comes out at conradrocks.net. Just go to the subscribe tab. I do behind the scenes stuff. I'll send it out as an email to my subscribers. Um, and you never know what you're going to get. It could be a prophetic word that I won't release to the public. So God bless you. I want to thank you for being in my life. And until we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comraderocks.net. Don't forget the National Day of Prayer, May 5th. You gotta go. You gotta go. Let's take our nation back for Jesus. Amen.